On the surface, Wendy Andriano appeared to be a caring wife to her husband, Joe, and a loving mother to their two children. But in reality, behind closed doors, Wendy resented her terminally ill husband and wished to be free from him. She hated what her life had become with him, and in fact despised being his caregiver. As her husband's health slowly deteriorated at home, Wendy did everything in her power to try and get a life insurance policy for him. But as Joe was too sick, no company would go through with it, and so she failed time and time again. But then, in the early hours of the 8th of October, a fed-up Wendy decided to take things into her own hands and to end Joe's life prematurely, as things were not moving fast enough in her opinion. Incredibly, when Wendy called 911, she accused Joe of attacking her first, which then caused her to kill him in self-defense. 911, what is your emergency? My husband's dead. What is your name, ma'am? Blood everywhere. My name's Wendy. My husband tried to kill me. He tried to strangle me and I hit him and then I tried to call 911 and then I didn't want to get involved and so I stopped and then he so started being mad at me and then tried to take off after me again and I hit him again. Was this true? What had really happened that fateful night? Had Wendy really acted in self-defense? Or had her patience worn thin? And had she finally decided to take matters into her own hands and brutally murder her husband? Wendy Elizabeth Ochea was born on the 6th of August, 1970, into a very religious household. Her family travelled around a lot for ministry, which was difficult on her childhood, but despite all this, Wendy still excelled in school. Wendy herself described her upbringing as extremely strict, and she once claimed that her father sexually assaulted her. But when asked about the event, she said she could not remember it, and so people were unsure if this was true, or maybe even a dream. In January of 1994, Wendy married a man called Joseph Andriano, and they had two children together, where they then settled in Phoenix, Arizona. Four years into their marriage, however, Joe fell very ill, and he tried to heal himself through holistic therapy, but this was unsuccessful. After undergoing three surgeries to try and remove a recurring tumour in his salivary gland, as well as multiple misdiagnoses, Joe was finally diagnosed with metastatic adenoid cystic carcinoma in 1998. By this time, the cancer had spread to his lungs, and his condition was deemed terminal. And so in the year 2000, he finally agreed to try chemotherapy. Joe's condition did not improve, however, and Wendy naturally became his caregiver, alongside her job as an apartment manager. But Wendy quickly began to resent her increased responsibilities. In her mind, this was not the life and the marriage she had signed up for. She was still a young 30-year-old, and now was forced to look after her two young children, as well as her sick husband. She wanted a different life. In time, Wendy began to frequent bars on a weekly basis, and she started having numerous affairs. During the summer of the year 2000, Wendy started seeing a man called Rick, a resident of the apartment complex where she lived and worked as the apartment manager. Rick did not know that Wendy was married and with two children, so when he found out, he ended their relationship, but Wendy was not happy about this, and she aggressively pursued Rick. On one occasion, it was said that she stood outside his apartment late at night, banging on his door for five minutes, demanding to be let in, but when he wouldn't let her in, she threatened to go and get the master pass key so that she could get into his property herself. During that same summer, Wendy was seen dancing, flirting, and even kissing men in numerous bars. On the 27th of September, Joe had his fourth chemotherapy treatment, and that same evening, Wendy went to a dance club, where she met a man and started kissing him. She then brought the man from the club back to her home, and proceeded to have sex with him. During a phone conversation the following day, Wendy lied to the man, saying that her husband had died of cancer. One day, Wendy also asked her ex-lover, Rick, if he could pose as her husband, Joe, during one of his hospital checkups. If they could prove that Joe was fit and healthy, they could receive insurance on his life. But despite Wendy offering Rick $10,000 to do this, Rick refused. Throughout the rest of the year, Wendy made several other attempts 
to obtain insurance on Joe's life through various companies. It is unclear, however, whether Joe was in on this or even if he knew that this was going on, as there's conflicting information. But one thing was clear, Wendy was adamant and she would do whatever she could to get this life insurance policy. During one pre-screening process with an insurance company, Wendy claimed that Joe did not have cancer. Another company contacted Joe in September after supposedly receiving an electronic pre-application. Joe replied to them by saying that he was not interested in applying, but three days later, Wendy sent them back an email from her personal email account asking that Joe's request be reinstated and asking that any further contact be made directly with her and not through Joe. Once again, she also tried asking someone else to pose as Joe. She offered to pay two men $50,000 if they could pretend to be Joe during a life insurance physical exam, but once again, they both refused. Wendy grew increasingly frustrated and annoyed about this, and she never managed to get her hands on a life insurance policy. With her growing resentment towards Joe and thinking that he would have died by now, her mind went to a very dark place and Wendy brought it upon herself to shorten Joe's life and to get rid of him as quickly as possible. On the 7th of October 2000, Wendy, Joe and their two small children attended a barbecue at a friend's house. They returned to their apartment around midnight and they put the children to bed. At about 2.15 a.m. on the 8th of October, Wendy called a co-worker of hers called Chris, who also lived at the apartment complex. Wendy asked Chris if he could come around their apartment and watch the children so that Wendy could take Joe to the doctor, as he apparently wasn't in a good state. When Chris arrived, Wendy met him outside the apartment and Wendy told Chris, I have a problem, don't ask any questions. My husband's on the floor dying and I haven't called 911 yet. He doesn't know I haven't called 911. Chris was confused why Wendy hadn't called 911 yet, and Chris urged her to make the call. Wendy went back into the apartment, and Chris followed her in. Wendy then went into another room, and finally called 911, asking for help to come. 911, what is your emergency? And my husband's not feeling well, he's kind of turning blue, he vomited on the floor, he says he feels like he's having a heart attack. Upon entering the apartment, Chris found Joe lying on the living room floor in the fetal position. It was clear to Chris that Joe was having difficulty breathing and he appeared very weak and had just vomited. As Chris approached him, Joe mustered up the energy to ask Chris for help, adding that he had needed help for a long time and asking why it was taking the paramedics over 45 minutes to arrive. When Wendy returned into the living room, she asked Chris if she could use his car to drive Joe to the hospital herself as the ambulance was responding to another call. Wendy then tried to help Joe get to his feet, as he was too weak to do so himself, but when she was unable to get him up, Wendy started shouting at Joe and calling him names and being aggressive towards him. Chris then heard some sirens from outside, so he left the apartment in order to flag them down and to tell them where to go. As the paramedics were unloading their equipment, Wendy ran out of the apartment and shouted at them, telling them to go away and she then ran back into her home and slammed the door behind her. Chris and the four paramedics were immediately confused by Wendy's reaction, and they started knocking on the apartment door, but no one answered. After five to ten minutes of knocking, the paramedics called the Phoenix Fire Department alarm room. The alarm room then proceeded to call Wendy's home in an attempt to get her to open the front door. After a few minutes, the alarm room told the paramedics that they had successfully made contact with Wendy and that she was coming outside to speak with them. But rather than coming through the front door, which opens directly into the living room, Wendy went out through her back door, climbed over the back patio wall, and then walked around the apartment building to the front door, where Chris and the paramedics were standing. Suspiciously, Wendy had also changed her shirt from the last time they had seen her, and her hair was wet. Wendy told the paramedics that Joe was dying of cancer, and he had a do not resuscitate order. She explained that this was not the way he wanted to go, and so the paramedics had no choice but to leave without entering the apartment and without checking on Joe. An hour or so later, at 3.39 a.m., Wendy called 911 once again, and this time she was in hysterics, claiming that Joe had attacked her 
and that she had hit him back in self-defense. 911, what is your emergency? My husband tried to kill me. He tried to strangle me and I hit him and then I tried to call 911 and then I didn't want to get involved and so I stopped and then he so started being mad at me and then tried to take off after me again and I hit him again. When the same paramedics as earlier arrived, they saw Wendy wearing a bloody t-shirt and standing outside the apartment talking to a police officer. When the paramedics entered the apartment, they found Joe lying on the floor in a pool of blood. He had a deep stab wound to the left side of his neck and lacerations on his head that exposed some brain matter. A broken bar stool covered in blood was found near Joe's body, as were pieces of a lamp, a kitchen knife with blood on the sharp edge, a bloody pillow and a belt. The crime scene looked absolutely brutal and everyone wondered what had really happened. Had this really been self-defense? Or had Wendy had enough and murdered her own terminally ill husband? Wendy claimed that that night she was attempting to assist Joe in taking his own life when they both got scared and decided to call for help. She claimed that after 911 was called and once Chris had left the apartment to meet the paramedics, Joe decided that he still wanted to follow through with the plan. She said that after the paramedics left, she finally admitted to Joe that she had had an affair. Joe then became violent and tried to choke her with a phone cord, but she was able to reach a knife, cut the cord and free herself. When she put the knife down, Joe bent over to pick it up, grabbing it, saying that he was going to kill himself. In order to stop him, she started hitting him with the bar stool. She claimed that in all the struggle, her hand slipped off the knife and that suddenly there was blood everywhere. She denied that she had stabbed Joe and that ultimately Joe had slit his own throat. Initially, Wendy managed to escape suspicion, but the investigators couldn't ignore the inconsistencies in her story. As they dug deeper, they uncovered shocking evidence that painted a different picture of the grieving widow she was playing. Investigators looked through Wendy's recent internet search and they discovered that Wendy had searched online for lethal doses of prescription drugs just days before the murder. A further search of Wendy's storage unit revealed an open cardboard shipping box containing a 500 gram bottle of sodium azide, two Tupperware containers containing sodium azide, nine Q-tips, a plastic knife and fork, and two pairs of latex gloves. Wendy's fingerprints were found on some of these items. Investigators also searched through Wendy and Joe's apartment and they found gelatin capsules filled with sodium azide in a bottle labelled for herbal supplements. Trace amounts of sodium azide were also discovered in the contents of a pot and two soup bowls in the kitchen. In all, 20.8 grams of sodium azide could not be accounted for. However, trace amounts of it were found in Joe's blood and gastric contents. Police suspected that maybe Wendy had been trying to poison Joe in the days leading up to the 8th of October. The autopsy also determined that Joe had sustained brain hemorrhaging, caused by no fewer than 23 blows to the back of his head, 8 to 10 of which independently could have rendered Joe unconscious. Defense wounds on Joe's hands and wrists indicated, however, that he was conscious for at least part of the attack. Joe also sustained a three and three quarter inch long by two inch wide stab wound to the left side of his neck that extended to his spine and severed his artery. The medical examiner suggested that the blows to Joe's heads were likely sustained before the stab wounds to the neck and that Joe was likely unconscious when he was stabbed, proving he could not have done it himself, as Wendy had claimed. The blood splatter at the crime scene also showed that Joe was lying down while he was being struck and he did not get up during the attack. It was clear to investigators that this had been a brutal crime and that Wendy's account of what had happened that fateful night was far from the truth. The attack on Joe had been so brutal and Wendy was obviously lying. So with all the growing evidence against her, she was taken into custody on suspicion of first degree murder. Four years after the crime, on the 23rd of August 2004, Wendy's murder trial began, and even though she had no prior criminal record, she faced the death penalty. The prosecution presented a compelling case against her, 
including evidence of her internet searches, phone records, and the testimony of friends and family who revealed her cold-hearted behavior after Joe's death. They also brought up evidence of Wendy's extramarital affairs, proving that she had a motive for killing her husband to be free to pursue other relationships. They also brought up evidence of Wendy's attempts to obtain insurance on Joe's life. Though she had failed to obtain any, it did confirm her plan, knowledge and intent to kill Joe, and it also showed that she premeditated Joe's murder. In addition, prosecutors alleged that she was tempted by a potentially large yield from a medical malpractice lawsuit filed against Joe's doctors. They attempted to prove that Wendy used a pesticide, sodium azide, to poison her husband, to appear as if Joe's death was the result of a heart attack. Wendy's hairdresser also testified that Wendy had told her in February of 2000 that she would have divorced Joe were he not ill. At a later visit to her hairdressers, Wendy disclosed that Joe wanted to keep the marriage together, but she was emotionally out of it and wished he was dead so she could move on with her life. At another visit to the hairdressers in August, Wendy told her that she was interested in another man who was hesitant to get involved with her because she was already married. The defense, on the other hand, wanted to prove that Wendy was a domestic violence victim who lived in fear of her abusive husband, whom she bludgeoned to death in self-defense. At the trial, Wendy testified in her own defense, and she took the stand for nine days, claiming she had been battered by her husband. She stated that on that fateful night, after a failed attempt at helping Joe take his own life, Joe flew into a rage after she told him about her affair, and this led to a struggle with a knife and a fight during which she hit Joe with a bar stool in self-defense. She said that during this struggle, her hand slipped off the knife and that Joe had ultimately slit his own throat. The defense concluded in their closing argument that Joe had taken his own life that night and that Wendy was a domestic violence victim who had acted in self-defense. After the intense trial, the jury finally reached a verdict and on the 18th of November, 2004, Wendy Elizabeth Andriano was found guilty of first-degree murder. Her deceitful web of lies had finally caught up with her and a month later, she was sentenced to death by lethal injection due to the heinousness, cruelty, and depravity of the crime. In 2007, Wendy filed a post-conviction appeal, claiming that evidence of her affairs and efforts to buy life insurance policies for her husband unfairly prejudiced her in front of the jury. She also claimed that jurors were unfairly not allowed to consider lesser charges, such as second-degree murder or manslaughter, but ultimately, her conviction was upheld by the Arizona Supreme Court in July of 2007. After her direct appeal was over, Wendy's case entered post-conviction relief. Here, her defense team argued that prosecutor Juan Martinez had unfairly prejudiced the jury because he took every opportunity to infuse the trial with marginally relevant information about her partying and man-chasing, but once again, the Arizona Supreme Court pushed away the allegations. Despite ongoing legal appeals, Wendy, to this day, remains on death row, and she is one of the three women on Arizona's death row, the others being Shauna Ford and Samantha Allen. The other two women currently on death row are Wendy Andriano and Shauna Ford. Andriano bludgeoned her 33-year-old husband to death with a bar stool and then slit his throat. The medical examiner also found a pesticide in his system, and Ford shot 29, a 29-year-old man and his nine-year-old daughter to death in a home invasion that she orchestrated to rob the family. She believed their home contained drugs and weapons and cash, and she intended to use the proceeds to fund a border watch group. Wendy's cruel actions towards her terminally ill husband are unimaginable. The steps she took to take his life are completely disgusting, and Wendy was clearly the abuser here, not poor Joe. He was clearly being treated horribly by the woman who was supposed to love and care for him. In his time of need, she completely neglected him, pushed him aside, and planned his death. Joe was obviously taking too long to die in Wendy's eyes, and she wanted to be free from him. 
I can't begin to imagine how Joe was feeling in his last moments. And as always, I just want to finish this off by saying, rest in peace, Joe. And my heart goes out to all his friends and family and to everyone who was impacted by Wendy's disgusting and selfish actions.